A priest walked into a pub in Ireland and was indignant to find so many of his parishioners there instead of in church. So he rounds them up and shepherds them into the church. And he solemnly says, all those who want to go to heaven, step here to the left. And everyone stepped over except one man who stubbornly stood his ground. The priest looked sternly at him and said, don't you want to go to heaven? No, said the man. Do you mean to stand there and tell me that you don't want to go to heaven when you die? Of course I want to go to heaven when I die, Father, but I thought you were going there now. <laughs> so All Saints Day is one of those markers in our church year when we reflect upon loved ones who have died and wonder where they are. What are they doing now? I remember a couple of years ago talking to a six-year-old, it was just after 9-11, and her grandmother had died, and it was very easy to talk about her grandmother being in heaven with God. But then she said, but those bad people who flew the planes into the buildings, they're in hell, aren't they? And she heard that from her teacher. And they, we, then we got into a discussion about hell and where the, all the bad people go. Most of us still have this image of God where heaven is up there and hell is down here and we are somewhere in the middle. And until recently, the Roman Catholic Church taught about purgatory. There was a kind of waiting room, a kind of annex where you were kind of waiting to get ready so that you could go up in, into heaven. So most of us have this kind of Disneyland world of heaven. Some people believe that the the, the streets are paved with gold, angels are playing, a sort of celestial Disneyland. And then there's the other place filled with fire and brimstone, the great underworld where Satan and other fallen angels are in charge. And our existence on the planet Earth is somewhere in the middle. It's interesting how uh, children who weren't baptized, it was believed that they would go to this limbo, this kind of purgatory place, place of waiting. And Christians remain in solitary confinement until uh, they are baptized. And even that was applied to Jewish people. If you were a Jew, that there were Christians who believed that you weren't gonna go to heaven. It didn't matter about losing the body. In, in the 16th century, 17th century, we had the practice of if someone was accused of being a witch, we would throw them in the water to see if they floated. It doesn't matter about the body. It was the soul that had to be saved so they could live forever in paradise. So today we think about what do we believe about heaven and hell? Where do we want to go? Where do you think you were going, and how might that affect the way you live now? Where are the people you love and I love but see no longer, whooping it up in heaven or frying down below, in the waiting room or out there somewhere we don't know, or in here somewhere? And the church has taught different things about these subjects over 2,000 years. And we could take a 10 mile radius of St. Paul's and we would have all sorts of ideas. We had a discussion on Wednesday. Uh, we have a Eucharist here at 12 and we just opened it up for discussion. And we had everything from incarnation, people believing that we come back again, if, uh, to get it right. Maybe there's a few lessons we still have to learn. And the church taught that until about the fourth century that incarnation was actually a part of Christian doctrine. And you had to learn something and keep coming back as a soul in a body until work was completed and your soul could return to God. And then the church realized it had more control and power over people if sin and forgiveness, absolution, and people's fear of the afterlife or themselves for their loved ones. So heaven and hell become centers of reward and punishment again. And the church makes a lot of money investing in that kind of dichotomy through the sale of indulgences 
to keep you and your loved one free from damnation. In many English churches, there are still remnants of this practice where rich families would build chantry chapels. They would be private family chapels, and they would employ a priest to say masses for the repose of the soul of dead members of that family. In the Protestant Reformation, we did away with most of that. And we had problems with praying for the dead. There was a kind of, well, life is over, you've made your bed, if you're good, you're gonna to go to heaven, or it might be, you know, deathbed confession, all that is good, that belief in Jesus, you're gonna to go to heaven, and if you don't get that, then you're going to go to hell. There's a wonderful story, a true story, about the Roman Catholic Bishop of Cork when he hears about the Anglican Bishop of Cork who has died. And he says, well, now he'll know who the real Bishop of Cork is. But in more recent years, our church has been more humane, more pastoral, maybe more Christian, in praying for the dead, remembering them, wishing them well as they continue their journey. And it's amazing that the dead still hold tremendous power over us, things said and unsaid, painful relationships that still haunt us and distort us. A friend told me a story, it was a disturbing story. He always had a difficult relationship with his mother. His mother was always kind of on his back. And right on her deathbed, she said, you know, I never ever loved you. And he said, mother, I love you. You're not gonna get me now. And how do you live with that? But there must be some kind of change from glory into glory. There must be still some work that both the living and the dead are called to do in the light of God and in the eternity of God. And one would hope that the good Lord would continue to work with her and with us after our life here is completed. I love the words of that hymn, changed from glory into glory, implying there's a dynamic quality, not only about this life, but the afterlife there is some form of continued growth in love and awareness. When I worked at All Saints Church in Pasadena, I had a wonderful uh, rector and mentor, George Regas, and he used the image of people who are the saints in our lives who stand on our balconies. It's a wonderful image. And some of them are alive and some of them are dead, and their, their job is simply to cheer us on. You know, and you think of those relationships in our lives and then maybe beyond our lives, our job when we are not here anymore is to cheer on those people, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, the people who are courageous, who are continuing to do the work that maybe we started. And we think about the people who have shaped our lives and continue to be shining examples of the unconditional love of God. They believe in you even when we did not believe in ourselves. And we live into some vision that some of us find hard to see, and we call that the communion of saints. It was the first Christians who called each other saints. 67 times in the New Testament, the word saint is used. And it's not about some little club of special Christians who do better than the rest of us. The saints were everybody who were believers. One day a woman found a precious diamond and rejoiced. She had something to sell to send her kids to college until one day a friend in need asked her for the diamond so that she could have something to eat. She gave it to her friend. Later that day her friend came back and said to her, thank you for your gift of the diamond, but I'm returning it. The gift I want from you is what it was that made you give me the diamond in the first place. Something very precious to you. That's the real treasure I want. I remember listening to a sermon in Grace Cathedral, Alan Jones, who was the dean then. He talked about, uh, he said, Christian orthodoxy demands that I believe in a place called hell. It's a wonderful sermon. He said, but I don't have to believe as a Christian there's anybody in it. 
Christian orthodoxy demands that I believe in a place called hell. And there is a place called hell. I mean, I've seen people who are in hell. But is that more of a choice? It's interesting, he also talked about in hell there are no gates. If we're in hell, it's a choice we've made. But if we believe in a God of unconditional love, how can we believe that that God is somehow punishing God's own creation, God's own treasure, God's own diamonds? That wonderful psalm, O God, you have searched me out and known me. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make my grave, you are there also. And in the Christian creeds, there's a wonderful phrase that sometimes in Protestantism, we have difficulty with this, that, that Christ descends into hell. He descended into hell. So there is no place that the love of God and the redeeming power of Christ cannot permeate. He descended into hell. If Christ can descend into this life and into hell, then there is hope for all of us. And I think that's why it is called good news. There's a wonderful poem, the dead have a pact with the living, they never leave us. They are in the mother's milk and the wailing child. The dead never, never leave us, the dead have a pact with the living. So today we are invited to make peace with our dead and they long to make peace with us and help us on our journey sometimes in spite of themselves. In the Celtic tradition and in the Greek Orthodox tradition, there is this idea that there are special spaces on the earth that we call thin spaces. In Orthodox churches, it is the, the building itself. The reason why Orthodox churches are so beautifully decorated with gold and stars, it is the idea that when you enter that building, you are entering heaven itself. This is a kind of you're already in heaven. And sometimes in our buildings, we get that sense of this transcendent otherness. And in the Celtic tradition, there are holy places where there is this thin space between heaven and earth that we are invited to enter. And in, in many ways in the uh, calendar, today is such a thin space. It is a thin space in our liturgy, in our calendar. When the light is, as we go into the darkness of winter, today we are blessed with a little more light, a little more sleep, a little more encouragement before we enter the darkness of winter. The columbarium, the candles, the memorial plaques, the windows, the stories, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who cheer us on our way. And the words of Jesus at the Eucharist, remember me, the candles in the darkness, the darkness or the gates of hell will not prevail against them. The one who holds us in the palm of his hand, living and departed, knows what he's doing. Amen.